at the Psalm 33 tonight. Let's finish it up if we can. I think we can. We on the internet yet? Uh, okay. Had something I want to say, but that's, that's okay. Psalm 33. I think we got down to about verse 9. I think we finished verse 9. and I want to start out verse 9 tonight, and I want to finish it up from there. Okay? Now, one of the things that, that strikes me, now, if you're reading from a King James tonight, you won't see this there, okay? But if you read from another version, they use the term steadfast love, steadfast love over and over again throughout the Old Testament, steadfast love. And I come across that in my reading and studying a few years back, and Every time I see that now, it just, it, it, it brings back some thoughts. And so that's kind of where this, this, this idea tonight came from. So are you with me in verse nine? We're going to start there and then we're going to actually verse 10 is what we're going to pick up. But verse nine, it says, for he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. They talk about the things that God's able to do. Okay. The things that God's able to do. It, it's it's making that application in creation. I told the guys last night that I spoke to, I said, I, I just got lazy this year. I had too many things going on. But I, I want to start reading my Bible. And as I read my Bible, I want to write down in a journal how many times... God makes a promise or somebody says something about God's promise and then makes the statement that he created the heavens and the earth. Okay. And I know I, I drove this home last week, but we're going to start out driving it home this week. Folks, when we look at our life, we look at, I don't care what we look at. We look at some big mountain in front of us. Well, we got some sickness that's come upon us. And here's this big mountain. Or here's this big financial mountain that's in front of us. This big mountain of, of our relationship with our husband or wife. With our kids. Whatever it is, this big mountain that we see in front of us that we can't move. God created the heavens and the earth. And he did it effortlessly. He just spoke. And so these things that we can't do in our life, these things that other people can't do for us in our life, save somebody, whatever it is, God can move that mountain effortlessly okay and i want to write those down when i read through my bible i do i just i want to see i, I want to and when i do it i'm going to tell y'all how many times it's there okay <laughs> i am i was watching a man oh I, i'm thinking about preaching thinking about preaching in ephesians y'all just pray for me but i was watching a man he was talking about election. He said the word, the Greek word for election is found five times in the Bible. We make it a big stumbling block. 475 times we find the word faith in the New Testament. That's pretty good. Wonder which one we ought to worry more about. I was telling you. And so anyway, uh, we got to go. Let, let, let's go. Uh, so he starts out, and I wanted to start out with that. With just, just the fact that when God speaks, it's done, man. It, it, it stands fast. Let's look at verses 10 through 12. We're going we're gonna to see the faithfulness of his work. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. 
Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he had chosen for his own inheritance. Now, the ISV and the ASV and the ESV, let's, let's just hear what they got to say in verse 10. The Lord makes void the counsel of nations. He frustrates the plans of peoples. Jehovah, self-existent one, Jehovah bringeth the counsel of the nations to nothing. He maketh the thoughts of the people to be of no effect. And then the ESV, and I know some of you are, are reading from that. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of people. Okay? Now, when we get to verse 10, up to verse 10, so, so in the, the previous few verses, the psalmist, David, he is, he is talking about God's creating the heavens and earth. But when he gets down to verse 10, now he broadens out what he's saying. It's no longer the heavens and the earth. Now he's getting into uh, the realm of mankind. Uh, William, last week, he defined for us what, uh, yeah, a deist is. And a deist basically... They, they teach that God created, he just wound it up, set it still, and turned around and walks off. But God's, he's, he's interacting into his creation. He's concerned. He's, he's, inter, he's interacting. He has a plan for creation. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. He has a plan for eternity, okay? And that's what the psalmist is talking about right here. Okay, it's broader than this uh, creation. It's all of God's work. It's his plan, and it's completely trustworthy, and he's going to bring it to pass. Okay, verse 10 and 11. Look with me in verse 10 and 11, if I can find it. Here we go. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the vices of the people of none effect. Okay, now... In verse 10 and 11, 11, same thing. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. There's contrast, two words there. One is cancel. I can't say that word right. My wife picks on me all the time about it. It's not cancel. You're not canceling something, Marty. You're canceling, okay? You're, you're, you're giving advice. So how's that? that? That word means plan. It's the plan of people. And the other one is the purpose. It's the intention of people. So, so look at it, verse 10. The Lord brings the plans of the nations, of the heathen nations, to nothing. And he maketh the devices or their intentions or their purposes of the people of none effect. There's people out here that make all kinds of plans. Right now, there's people planning on running the nation come November, whoever they may be. The Democrats are doing it. The Republicans are doing it. The, the independents are doing it. Everybody's got a plan. They got a plan in the Middle East. The, the Iraq, Iran, Iran is planning on bombing something, and everybody's looking at it, you know. They got a plan over in Russia and Ukraine. Everybody's got a plan. God looks at the plans of the nations and he brings them to nothing. You think about World War II. Now, Adolf Hitler done something detrimental. We better be glad he done it, but he done something detrimental. He had a war on one front and then he decides he's going to open up a a, a war on another front. Well, the Russians, what the Russians done on the Russian front was they pushed just enough resistance there and then they pulled back. Russia's a big country. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's a great big country. They put a little bit of resistance there and they pulled back. Well, the Germans had the superior army. 
Now, it was weakened by the fact they were fighting on two fronts, but it was a superior army. But guess what? God sends the worst winner ever. Nobody could have predicted that. He sends the worst winner ever, and he defiles the plans of Adolf Hitler. Boom. This stumps him right off the planet. God frustrates the plans, the best of plans. We need to include God in our plans when we're making plans. We really do. We forget that a lot. We really do. We really do. Um, look at verse 11. So in contrast to the nations that, that get together and they make their plans, look at God. Verse 11, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. The Lord's purposes stand firm. They endure. The bottom line is that the world plans cannot interrupt the plans of the Lord. So let's, let's go back to the Middle East. You got, you got Israel. We're going to talk about this if we can get there. We've got 10 minutes. We're going to try to get there. But you have Israel. If I say a Jewish person, what, what, what are you going to say? Yeah. God's chosen people. That's, that's, that's God's chosen people. That, that's, that's, what, that's, that, that's what we've been told. That's what the Bible says. We understand that he developed this group of people. So with God's chosen people, if by chance they could remove the government out of Israel and <clears throat> the Muslim nations take over Israel tomorrow, what does that do with our plans? Does that destroy God's plans? No. No, it don't. You're right. It don't. We've been conditioned to say that it does, but it don't. God brought them back out, out of the dust one time. He can bring them out of the dust again. He's actually brought them out of the dust three times. He can bring them out of the dust again. Okay. So I don't, I think we ought to support them. Y'all, I'm not trying to get political, but, but I, I think we ought to support Israel. You know, it's like, all, it's like the bully on the playground and the little kid over here with glasses that that is half his size, and somebody's picking on him, you know. And and I mean that's what it is. I mean you got this little bitty, little bitty, three million people on Rhode Island, and everybody pushing against them. So anyway, that's that's Marty's two cents. You. You can hate on me if you want to, I guess. But, um, so an example would be God planned salvation for man. From the foundation of the world, God planned, God planned salvation from the foundation of the world. Amen? Amen. Okay. So before he ever created Adam, before he ever created a garden, he planned salvation. All right. And da, 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 da. Let's get in the right chapter, Marty. I'm going somewhere. You just hang on. <clears throat> this is, you don't go there. This is Ephesians. You'll just have to trust me. Ephesians 3. I mean, Ephesians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. Okay. He chose us to do something in particular. It's in the next part of that verse. That we should be holy and without blame. Okay. So that's what he chose us for. That's what he predicted. But Satan 
went against God's plan all the way back to the garden. What, what was, come on now, what, what was, what did God promise Eve when he was handing down the judgments? Right. So what did Eve automatically think when she has her first son? Yeah. Oh, here's the seed. All right. Satan said, here's the seed. Let me get with the other son. Kill him. God don't like you as good as him. Kill him. He'll have to like you best. What happened? Did that fool God's plan? No. God sent another one. Let me tell you something. Salvation is not plan B. It was plan A from the beginning. When we see things happening, whatever we see happening, and we think God's plans is being fooled, no. God's plans being worked out in this world all the time. Can Marty explain that? Absolutely not, but I believe it because the Bible says it. No, we're not. You know why? Because his ways are much higher than our ways. His thoughts are much higher than our thoughts. We have to humbly submit and believe what we see. And there's a lot of times we have tensions between things. I can't add this up with that. It don't make any sense. But it, in God's mind, it works. All right, so anyway. So all the way back then, Satan's trying to destroy the seed. What happens when Jesus is born? Who did he send after him? Herod. Herod killed no telling how many hundreds of babies. But God protected the seed. When the seed was baptized and recognized and identified with the message of the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Satan come to him personally and tempted him and tested him and said, look, if you'll just bow before me, you, we can, we can just... Go around this thing. But no, he went to the cross. He's talking to Peter. Peter, Satan desires to sift you as sweet as wheat, man. But I prayed for you. You see, God's plan is steadfast. He's got a plan. And it's steadfast. We can depend on it. He's got purposes. Yeah, amen. The Lord brings the knot and annuls or thwarts the plans of the heathens, but the Lord's purposes stand firm and they endure. Even in his plan of redemption, it, it, it stands firm. Verse 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people in whom it, uh, he had chosen for his own inheritance. Now, we're out of time, but I'm going to deal with verse 12. We misuse this verse quite often. Was they a church at this point in time in Scripture? No. We can't read the New Testament back into the Old Testament. We must read what's there, what they had at the time. What they had at the time, who was the nation of the Lord? Israel. It's still his nation, Israel. America's not the Lord's nation. Oh, I'm going to get in trouble here. I know I am. I'm a nationalist. I love my country. I love my country. Best country ever. Period. Period. I love my country. Okay. National pride is not my religion. Okay? 
God didn't save America. God called it out. He did. I believe that with all my heart. He created it. He helped it get created. It was, it was based a long, long time ago. It was based on his word, on his Ten Commandments. That's why it was on the courthouse steps of every courthouse in the whole country. Okay? That's why in, on our coins, as in God we trust, on our dollars, it's in God we trust. Okay? Because our nation had, it was founded with godly principles. Versus France, who had the almost the identical same creator of their, their document as we had, but they based theirs on humanistic principles. We based ours on theocentric principles. Okay? Now, that don't make us a Christian nation. They's always been more non-Christians than we can shake a stick at in America. And guess what? They get a vote. They get to run for politics. They get to run for dog catcher and everything else. Okay? Because that's what makes us different from everybody else. We have freedom, at least at the moment. We have freedom. Okay? Now, this, when he talks about his chosen people, he's talking about Israel. He's talking about his plan for Israel. And he frustrates all the other people that, that come against him. All right, so this is what Craig, well, let, let me go on and read what I got here. He pronounces a place, blessing on those who follow him. And this verse is misused quite a bit. Uh, in the verse, it's talking about God's covenant people, not America, but Israel. Uh, that is the nation he put his name upon. Israel. He gave them a land. He gave them the boundaries of the land. The blueprints in the Old Testament is right there. Okay? Listen to Craig. Craigie. The nation whose God is the Lord is blessed precisely because its uh, national existence is based upon the divine plan, not merely upon human aspirations. This is not Genghis Khan going to take over the world. It's not Adolf Hitler going to take over the world. It's not the Britons uh, going to put the Union Jack and it's going to, the sun's never going to set on the Union Jack influence around the world. Okay? That's, it's not that. It's blessed, but also it occupies an inevitable position among all nations. How did they become God's people? Can somebody answer that question? Yeah, how did Israel become God's people? He chose them. He just chose them. He did. Abraham, I'm calling you out. Guess what? When you're 100 years old, I'm going to give you Isaac. Isaac, guess what? I'm not going to pick your favorite. I'm going to pick the Younger. David, guess what? I'm choosing you, bud. And David, because you're a man after my own heart, I'm going to establish your throne forever. God did the choosing. That's his plan. We may not understand it. We may not always like everything Israel does. I don't. But they're still God's chosen people. They will remain God's chosen people. He has got a plan eternally for them. It will stand steadfast. We can have all the anti semitism I can you say it now. Yeah, we can have all the hate on Israel that we want. How's that? And it don't matter. They're still God's chosen people. Now, let me, let me make a real quick application to you. How did you get saved? Now, now you got to be careful with it. Huh? Grace, exactly. Did God do any choosing there? Yes. God chose you through faith, by grace. You're saved, okay? But God chose you. He, he, cut, he, he, he cut you out. He chose you. We may not have 
a land promise. But we got a deed promise that's bigger than a land promise. Okay? We do. An inheritance that is going to file anything you've ever seen here. Okay? And that stands sure. It stands fast, packed, because God did the saving. He saved you. He saved me. Makes no difference how the world looks, what it looks like. Listen to me, folks. We pick up this tent that we have, and if the Lord blesses us in the morning, we'll pick up this tent and we'll carry it 24 hours down the road. Okay? But this tent has not got foundations. But we're looking for a city whose builder and maker has foundations. Okay? That's where we're heading. Yeah. There won't be no Republicans or Democrats there or independents. It's going to be a theocracy. God's going to rule and reign. I'm looking forward to that, folks. I am. Man, can you imagine a place no sin? I know why you got to go, but can you imagine a place no sin? No sin. No lying. Nobody lying to you. You know, no pain. No telemarketers. No telemarketers. I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> no, no pain. No separation from your loved ones. No sin nature. The devil can't touch you because he's going to be gone. Amen. He going to be tied up. He going to be tied up with a spiritual chain. Ain't that going to be a good thing? That's going to be a great day, man. And it is as sure and as pat as the pew you sit in. As a matter of fact, more so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father.